Why are loud noises and music bad for my ears? Too many loud sounds can damage the tiny hair cells inside your ears. These cells line the fluid-filled cochlea, a part of your inner ear. And change sound vibrations in the fluid into nerve impulses. These impulses then travel to your brain, where they are recognized as sound. Listening to loud sounds causes strong vibrations that flatten the hairs of the inner ear. Too much flattening keeps the hairs from springing back just like blades of grass that have been walked on too much and they eventually die. There is no way to fix or replace the hairs, and hearing is damaged forever. So the louder the noise and the longer you listen to it, the more harm can be done. Sound is measured in units called decibels. People talking normally measures about 60 decibels on the scale. Any noise that registers above 70 decibels can be dangerous. Rock music at a concert usually produces about 110 decibels of sound. How do you know which is which? The problem is that you can't always know. Sometimes hurtful people can fool kids into thinking they are gentle and helpful. They may have pleasant faces and friendly voices, and they may say nice things. So it's important to follow personal safety rules with all strangers. What are some of the smallest animals in the world? Some people consider protozoa, which are a type of single cellate organisms including amoebas. Part of the animal kingdom. According to that classification, the microscopic protozoa would be the smallest animals. But many classification systems place protozoa in their own kingdom called protista. A group separate from the animal kingdom. Several types of insects are nearly microscopic, measuring only a fraction of a millimeter in length. The smallest mammals are considerably larger than that, Commer Sun's dolphin. Weighing around 50 to 70 pounds, 23 to 32 kilograms, is the smallest sea mammal. A bat that is about the same size as a bumblebee. Called Kitty's hognosed bat, may be the smallest land mammal. It is only about an inch long, 29 to 33 millimeters, and weighs around 0 0.07 ounces, 2 grams. What is an eclipse of the moon? Once in a while Earth's shadow falls on the moon. Temporarily blocking out the sunlight that causes it to shine. This is called a lunar eclipse. Just as in a solar eclipse. The phenomenon occurs when the sun, Earth, and the moon are arranged in a straight line. During a lunar eclipse, which can be seen at night. 
the moon will become smaller and smaller and then disappear before it emerges bit by bit from Earth's shadow. Why are the oceans salty? Oceans are salty because the water that fills them contains dissolved salt. Just like the kind we use on our food. The amount of salt in ocean water varies from place to place depending on the different sources of water nearby but averages about 3.5%. Over the course of millions of years, Rivers flowing over salt-containing rocks have emptied into the oceans. Bringing along dissolved salt particles. In addition, salt has leaked from solid salt-containing rocks directly into the seas. Salt can also enter the oceans from volcanic activity on the seafloor. What makes soda pop fizz? Soda pop gets its fizz from carbon dioxide, a harmless gas that makes up part of the air we breathe. It is mixed into soda pop to make it light and fun to drink. When a soda bottle or can is sealed, the gas can't escape and stays mixed with the beverage. But when soda is opened or poured into a glass, carbon dioxide which is much lighter than the liquid rushes to the surface in the form of bubbles and escapes into the air after bursting. Sometimes the bubbles rise so fast, bringing soda pop with them, that they make a frothy, fizzing foam. Soda pop goes flat when it has been left in an open container for a long time and has lost all of its bubbles, or carbonation. Why do I shiver when I'm cold? When your brain receives the signal that you are cold, it sets off a series of reactions. One of these reactions causes your muscles to repeatedly and quickly contract, or tighten, and relax. Muscle movement uses energy and produces heat, that is why people become warm when they exercise. In other words, when you feel cold, your body starts working on its own to make some extra heat to warm you up. Why does hair turn gray or white when a person gets old? A pigment called melanin is responsible for hair color, as well as for skin and eye color. The darker the hair of a person, the more melanin in that person's hair. As PEOPLE age, the supply of melanin to their hair may stop. Pigment containing cells live and ordinarily multiply in the hair root. While an aging person's hair still grows, the lack of melanin in it makes it gray or white. What causes warts? Warts are caused by certain viruses that invade skin cells and 
cause them to reproduce faster than normal, creating a hard bump. Warts can be spread by touch or by contact with skin shed by warts but most people are resistant to the different viruses that cause them and will not get warts even after contact. Although warts may not look very nice, they are not harmful. And they usually go away by themselves within a few months. Chemicals are available in drugstores that remove warts by destroying the abnormal skin cells that make them. Or doctors can remove warts by freezing, burning, or scraping them off. How are moths different from butterflies? While moths and butterflies are very similar and belong to the same order of insects. Lepidoptera, there are noticeable differences between them. Butterflies are generally active during the day, and moths are usually nocturnal, or active at night. Butterflies have knobs on the ends of their antennae, while moths do not. Butterflies tend to be more colorful than moths. And moths and butterflies hold their wings differently when at rest, moths lay theirs out flat. Like an airplane, while butterflies hold theirs vertically above their bodies. Why do I poop? The food that you eat which provides the energy that your body needs to keep running and the materials needed for growth and repairs goes through an amazing process once you put it into your mouth. First you chew it into smaller pieces with your teeth. These small pieces are softened by a watery liquid made by your mouths. Salivary glands and molded by your tongue into a soggy ball for swallowing. The chewed up food then begins a journey through a series of connecting tubes. Mushy food travels down your throat and esophagus into your stomach. Powerful muscles in the stomach wall crush it even further and along with strong digestive chemicals made there turn it into a thick soup. Then it goes to your small intestines, where its nutrients pass through thin walls into your bloodstream and are delivered to cells throughout your body. Following that, the leftovers of your food what your body can't use or digest travel to your large intestines. Along with other waste products of the digestive process. Their moisture is removed and returned to your body, and what remains of your food becomes solid waste. This waste is stored in a large tube called the rectum. When the rectum gets full of solid waste, or feces, you get rid of it with a bowel movement through a small opening in your bottom called the anus. Your food makes the entire journey through your digestive system in about 24 hours. Though it could pass through faster or slower than that, depending on the kind of food you've eaten. While you may think that the indigestible part of your food what becomes poop is useless. It is actually very necessary. The unused portion of food called fiber, makes the entire digestive system run smoothly. It gives the special muscles of the digestive tract which move food. 
along in traveling waves known as peristalsis something to grip onto. Why do mosquitoes bite? Just female mosquitoes bite, male mosquitoes feed only on fruit and plant juices. The female mosquito bites people, and other animals, to feed on their blood. She needs blood so that her eggs can develop properly before they are laid. One way a female mosquito locates a victim is by feeling the body heat of an animal as she flies by it. What is a fossil? A fossil is the hardened remains or an imprint of a plant or animal that lived a very long time ago. Some fossils are thousands of years old, others are several hundred million years old. Most plants and animals died and then decayed without ever leaving a trace. But some were buried under mud, rocks, ice, or other heavy coverings before decaying. The pressure of these layers over thousands of years turned animal and plant remains into rock. Usually fossils preserve the organism's hard parts the bones or shells of an animal and the seeds stems, and leaf veins of plants. Sometimes the fossil is the actual animal part, like a bone or tooth, that has hardened into rock. Some fossils, called trace fossils, show the imprint of parts of the animal or plant. Occasionally these imprints act as a mold and the sediment that fills the imprint hardens and becomes a cast of, for example, a dinosaur footprint. Sometimes bones or trees are preserved by minerals that seep into the part's pores and then harden, or petrify, that part. Arizona's petrified forest contains numerous examples of giant trees that were petrified millions of years ago. In some cases, an entire animal is preserved in ice. Hardened tree sap, called amber, or in dry, desert areas. In these instances, as with woolly mammoths found in Alaska and elsewhere, the whole animal hair. Skin bones, internal organs is preserved much as it was when it died thousands of years earlier. Why do people often say God bless you or Gesundheit after someone sneezes? Back before the development of modern medicines especially antibiotics a lot more people died from infectious diseases than they do today. Even things like colds could develop into serious and deadly infections. So a wish for God's blessings or good health the meaning of the German phrase. Gesundheit developed as an expression of care and concern for the health of the sneezer. How do seeds become plants? Once seeds are fully developed, they need a good place to grow. If they just fell to the ground beneath their parent plant, they would struggle. 
competing against each other for sunlight, water, and minerals. Most seeds need to travel, then by wind, water, or with the help of insects and other animals to better places to germinate, or start to grow into new plants. Some seeds, like those from conifer and maple trees, have wings attached. Others, like those of dandelions, have parachutes made of tiny hairs. Both features allow the seeds to be carried great distances by the wind. And they sometimes land in spots that are good for germination. Water carries other seeds to good growing places, the hard, watertight shell of a coconut. For instance, allows it to travel many miles at sea before finding a beach where conditions are suitable. For growth. Animals are great seed carriers. They take them from one place to another in their mouths. As does a squirrel preparing for winter, or sometimes seeds stick on their fur or feathers. But most often seeds travel in animals' digestive systems. Some plants grow colorful and tasty fruits. Which are really just fleshy seed coverings meant to attract hungry animals. When creatures like birds, bats, raccoons, or bears eat berries and other fruits they usually swallow the seeds whole. Safe inside a hard coating, the seeds pass through unaffected by digestive juices. Appearing many hours later in animal waste. The seeds sometimes emerge in places far from their parent plants, in locations better for germination. Seeds, then, sometimes have to wait a long time before they find good places to grow. Places where the sun, moisture, and temperature are right. Most seeds are designed for the weight, protected by a hard outer pod, except those of conifers. Some seeds wait years to germinate, and some just never do. But inside each seed pod is a baby plant, or embryo, and endosperm. A supply of starchy food that will be used for early growth if germination takes place. Then a tiny root will reach down into the soil, and a tiny green shoot will reach up, toward the light. What is hail? A hailstone is a ball made of layers of ice. It starts out as an ice crystal in a cloud, just as a snowflake does. But a hailstone is moved about by drafts or winds in the cloud. Rising into cold air and drifting down where the air is warmer, again and again. The process builds up layers of ice and melting snow on the hailstone. While the average size of a hailstone when it finally makes its way to earth is one quarter of an inch across. Hailstones can become large enough to cause real damage, denting cars, and damaging crops. The biggest recorded hailstones weighed well over 2 pounds. Fortunately, hailstones don't fall too often and usually only during spring and summer thunderstorms. What is the biggest city in the world? Because most big cities spread out, over time, into the land that surrounds them. 
it is often hard to say where a city begins and ends. When describing the size of a city which generally refers to its population, or the number of people that live there sometimes a distinction is made between the city itself, city proper, and the built-up areas around it, urban agglomeration. Another problem in finding the largest city in the world is that census is official. Counts of populations are such big and difficult projects that they are only done every decade or so. And a lot of people can come and go in 10 years. According to a 1997 United Nations count, Seoul. The capital city of South Korea in East Asia, is the most populous city in the world. Nearly 10.25 million people live there. When their surrounding urban areas are included in a population count, some of the world's other largest cities are Tokyo, Japan, New York City, United States, Mexico City, Mexico, and Bombay. India. Mexico City is also one of the world's fastest growing cities. Which animal is the deadliest? The poison dart frog found in the rainforests of the South American country Colombia. Produces one of the most toxic poisons in the animal kingdom. Many amphibians, the animal group to which frogs belong, produce toxins that make their skin taste bad so predators won't want to eat them. Some frogs, usually the brightly colored ones, produce poisonous secretions that can harm or even kill their enemies. The toxin made by the poison dart frog, if it enters an animal's bloodstream, can paralyze and even kill. There are many different types of these frogs, the most poisonous being a bright yellow. Frog whose toxin can kill a human if it gets into the person's mouth or into an open wound. The toxin can even work its way through unbroken skin. As little as one drop of this frog's poison can cause the heart to stop beating. Certain tribes in Colombia use the poison dart frog secretions. Obtained without killing the frogs, to coat their darts and arrows, hence the name given to the frog. What is the largest animal in the world? The largest animal in the world is the blue whale. It can reach a length of 110 feet, 33.5 meters, and weigh more than 150 tons, 300,000 pounds. Its head makes up nearly one quarter of its body, and its heart is the size of a small car. It is thought to be the largest animal that has ever lived, bigger than the largest dinosaur. Even a baby blue whale is bigger than an elephant, which is the largest land animal. There are two types of whales, toothed whales, which use their teeth to catch fish and squid that they usually swallow whole, and baleen whales, which are toothless, but have sheets of a horny substance called baleen attached to their upper jaws. The baleen works like a giant strainer. 
letting water including tiny plant and animal life called plankton move back and forth through it. Loads of plankton are trapped behind the baleen and then swallowed. The blue whale is an example of a baleen whale. Which means that the largest creature in the world feeds on some of the smallest plants and animals that exist. How does a tape recorder work? A tape recorder uses a magnetic language to record and play back music, words, and sounds. It does this by way of a plastic tape coated with tiny iron particles that are arranged in a haphazard way. Sound that enters a tape recorder's microphone is turned into electrical signals. These electrical signals, in turn, are changed into magnetic signals by an electromagnet, located in the recording head. When a recording tape rubs against the head as it winds from one spool to another, its metal particles are magnetized and rearranged in patterns that correspond with the different sounds being recorded. When a tape is played back, the reverse process takes place. When rubbed across a playing head, the iron particles of a tape send magnetic signals that are converted into electrical signals. These signals are then changed by the tape recorder's speaker into sound. The video cassette player, VCR, that you use to record television shows and play movies has a similar magnetic language. All the information that makes up sound and pictures can be stored on a videotape in magnetized metal particles, arranged in complicated patterns. Videotapes are much wider than cassette tapes because they carry so much more information. How deep are the oceans? The ocean floors have shelves, slopes, cliffs, mountains, valleys, and canyons, just like the surface of Earth. So the depth of each ocean varies greatly when measured in different places. The average depth of all the oceans is around 13,124 feet, 4,000 meters. Though the Arctic Ocean is by far the shallowest along the underwater edges of the continents. In what is called the continental margins, are deep, narrow canyons known as trenches. In these trenches are the ocean's greatest depths. The Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench extends down 36,198 feet, 11,034 meters, the Atlantic's Puerto Rico Trench reaches 28,374 feet, 8,648 meters, below sea level, the Indian Ocean's Java Trench descends for 25,344 feet. 7,725 meters, and the Arctic's Eurasia Basin reaches 17,881 feet, 5,450 meters, in depth. People can descend to the deepest parts of the oceans only in special vehicles. The deep sea is cold and sunless, and the pressure from the water above is almost crushing. But from ships on the surface, scientists can use sonar, or sound waves, 
to determine the depth of the seas and the shape of ocean floors. An instrument called an echo sounder sends out sound signals, which travel through water at nearly one mile per second. The signals are reflected back to the ship in echoes that show how far away the ocean floor is. The longer the echoes take to reach the ship, the deeper the water. What causes a burp? When you get food and drink into your airway, problems occur. But when too much air enters your digestive system, it's not a big deal. It just comes back up in the form of a burp. Sometimes a person takes in gulps of air when he or she eats or drinks too fast. Gum chewing can also lead to swallowed air. At other times, the food or drink like soda pop, for example is responsible for the burp. Filled with carbon dioxide gas to make it bubbly, soda releases air once it's in your stomach. How big will I become? Several different factors determine how big a person will grow. The most important one is heredity, the passing of physical traits from parents to children. When you began as a single fertilized cell, your mother and father each contributed. Half the genes coded chemical information needed for you to live and grow. These genes are responsible for your physical traits, like the color of your eyes and hair. How your body will be shaped, and how tall you will become. That is why children look a lot like their parents, or even their grandparents. They have inherited family characteristics that may have been passed on for several generations. If your parents are big or tall, chances are good that you will be big or tall, too. The average height of a woman in the United States is about 5 feet, 4 inches. 1.6 meters, and the average height for an American man is 5 feet, 9 inches, 1.75 meters. In spite of genetic coding, certain conditions can keep people from growing as large as their genes say they should. Bad nutrition keeps a body from reaching its maximum size. Poor health and disease do the same. That is why people who lived in generations before us, when food was sometimes scarce and health care was poor, were quite a bit smaller than we are today. Taking good care of your body, then, helps it become the best it can be. Where does meat come from? Meat is the flesh of any animal that is used for food. It is usually the muscle and connective tissue of an animal. Though organs like the liver and heart are also eaten. Cattle, sheep, and pigs provide most of the meat that people eat. People in different parts of the world usually eat more of one kind of meat than another. Usually because certain animals are easier to raise in particular environments. 
In the Middle East, for instance, sheep thrive on land that is too dry for cattle. Therefore, lamb and mutton, flesh from mature sheep, are the main meats eaten there. Cattle the source of beef are raised in big herds and need a lot of grazing room. So large countries that have a lot of pasture land like Argentina, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States raise the most cattle and eat the most beef. Wild cattle were tamed or domesticated about 9,000 years ago. They were valued as much for the work that they did carrying and pulling heavy loads as for the milk and meat that they provided. Over time, farmers developed breeds that were meant only to provide meat. Looking quite different from slim, long-legged dairy cows. Beef cattle have wide fleshy bodies and short legs. Today, livestock animals that are ready for market are usually shipped from the farms or ranches on which they're raised to big meat processing centers near large cities, where the food they provide is most needed. After they are slaughtered, their meat is packaged and sent to markets near and far. With the help of refrigerated trucks, trains, and ships. Other animal body parts like hides, hoofs, and bones are also put to good use. Making leather goods, fertilizers, and other products. Why do people and countries go to war with one another? Wars have taken place since the beginning of recorded history, and they surely occurred before that as well. A war begins when one group of people, the aggressors, tries to force its will on another group of people, and those people fight back. War frequently springs from the differences between people. Or from the desire of one group to increase its power or wealth by taking control of another group's land. Often the aggressors feel that they are superior to the group they want to dominate. They believe that their religion, culture, or even race is better than that of the people they wish to defeat. This sense of superiority makes them feel that it is acceptable to fight to take the land possessions, and even lives of the inferior group. Or to force their ways on the dominated people so that they resemble their conquerors. When Europeans settled North America, for example, the Native Americans who lived there fought a series of wars with them for the next 250 years, trying to keep their land and preserve their way of life. They eventually lost the battle and were forced to either live like their European conquerors or relocate to parcels of land set aside for them called reservations. Civil wars take place between groups of people within a single country. And international wars occur between nations. Because countries can be very different from one another in government, religion, customs, and ideology, ways of thinking, it is not surprising that nations disagree on many things. But great efforts are usually made to settle the disagreements through discussion and negotiation. A process called diplomacy before they result in anything as destructive as a war. War usually occurs when diplomacy fails. 
because science and technology have allowed us to create such powerful and destructive weapons that can result in such devastating wars. We now have international organizations that work all the time to try to keep peace among nations. What is acid rain? Some of the gases released as waste products from factories, cars, and power plants mix with water vapor in the atmosphere to produce acid rain, or sleet or snow. Rain is slightly acidic anyway, but when mixed with such chemicals as sulfuric acid and nitric acid, it can reach dangerous levels. Acid rain can damage soil, crops, and forests as well as eat away at the outer surfaces of buildings. In some places, acid rain that has fallen into lakes and rivers has caused severe harm to the animals and plants living there. Acid rain has affected many parts of the United States and Canada as well as countries in Northern and Western Europe and parts of Asia. Because the wind can carry pollutants great distances from their source. Many areas have suffered devastating effects of acid rain without being responsible for the chemical waste that caused it. What is the smallest lizard? Geckos, sometimes spelled geckos, are the smallest types of lizards. They are only about 1 inch, 3 centimeters, long. Geckos got their name from the frequent chirping and clicking noises they make. Most reptiles don't make any noise at all. They like warm climates, and, unlike many other reptiles, they frequently live peacefully among humans probably because they are harmless. They are less threatening because of their small size, and their insect diet is helpful to humans. The tiny, Hair-like coverings on their flattened feet make geckos extraordinary climbers. They are able to grip even very smooth surfaces. And they can climb straight up walls and even walk across ceilings. How is a lake different from a sea or ocean? A lake is different from a sea or ocean because it is completely surrounded by land. It is situated in a basin or hollow on Earth's surface and is usually shallow compared to a sea or ocean. Most lakes contain fresh water, though some especially those located in dry areas are filled with salt water. Lakes may get their water supply from rivers that empty into them or from underground springs, or from rain or melted snow. Lake Superior, located on the border between the United States and Canada, is the largest freshwater lake in the world, covering 31,700 square miles, 82,103 square kilometers. Lake Baikal, located in Russia, is the deepest freshwater lake, reaching down 6,365 feet, 1,940 meters.
Why do burning things make smoke? During a fire, the air around it becomes heated. The heated air sweeps up water vapor, molecules of water that float in the air. And tiny specks of the fuel, the material being burned, into a dark cloud of smoke. The more incompletely something burns, the more smoke it produces. Because more particles are left to be swept up into the air. Smoke gradually spreads out and drifts away, with gravity pulling the heaviest bits back to the ground. When a fire first starts to burn, there is usually a lot of smoke. Which decreases as more of the fuel is burned completely. Smoke detectors take advantage of the fact that fires cause a lot of smoke in their early stages. The detectors sense the small particles in smoke before a fire really starts to burn. An optical smoke detector uses a light beam and light sensor that sounds an alarm when smoke particles get in the way of the beam. An ionizing smoke detector can sense even smaller particles. They disturb a low electric current inside, which sets off an alarm. How can their knees bend that way? The answer is, they don't. What appear to be flamingos' knees are actually their ankles. Their knees are up closer to their bodies, hidden by feathers. And they are actually standing on their toes. If fish breathe oxygen, why can't they survive on land? Some fish can breathe on land. Of these, a few actually must breathe air these are called obligate air breathers. Others, like the eel-like lungfish, the bowfin, and the gar, are adapted to breathe either air or water. These fish probably evolved to breathe air because they live in warmer water where oxygen is present in smaller amounts. For the most part, however, fish must get their oxygen from water and not from air. If such fish are taken out of water, they suffocate. Fish are able to get oxygen from water through the many tiny blood vessels spread over the surface area of their gills. When fish are out of water, their gill arches collapse. And the blood vessels are no longer exposed to the oxygen in the air. Even fish that can breathe air must still live primarily in the Water because it is in water that they are capable of movement. If they can't move, they can't get food or escape from enemies. Why are some people blind? Blindness is complete loss of sight. It can happen when certain parts of the eyeballs, the optic nerves, which carry visual signals from the eyes to the brain, or the sight centers of the brain are damaged. 
such damage can occur as a result of injuries or diseases. A person can also be born with eye or brain abnormalities that cause blindness. In many cases, particularly in very poor countries. Infectious diseases and poor diets can also cause blindness. A lack of vitamin A, in fact, is the leading cause of blindness worldwide. With basic medicines and proper nutrition, such cases could be prevented. For every one person in the United States who is totally blind, there are four others who are visually impaired or legally blind. These people have some ability to see. But they see so poorly even with eyeglasses that they cannot do things that require good vision, like driving a car. How does a magnifying glass work? A magnifying glass is a convex lens. Which means that it is much thicker in the middle than around its edges. This shape bends the light waves of objects viewed through it, causing us to see them in unusual ways. When you hold a magnifying glass close to an object, its light waves are widened before they are focused on your eyes, causing the object to appear very large. But when you hold a magnifying glass out and view a distant object with it, the item appears smaller and upside down. This effect is due to the image being beyond the focus of the lens. The more curved a convex lens is, the greater its ability to bend light and magnify. Microscopes, which allow us to look at things that are too small to be seen with our eyes, and binoculars and telescopes, which make far away things look bigger and nearer to us, also use convex lenses. What do fish do in the winter when water freezes? If a body of water freezes completely, from the surface to the bottom, fish cannot survive for long unless they are like the Antarctic ice fish, which has chemicals resembling antifreeze in its blood to help it survive in water below freezing temperatures. For other kinds of fish, as long as there is some unfrozen water beneath the ice, they can generally survive the winter. The danger in such wintry conditions is not freezing to death but suffocating. Ice on the water's surface makes it hard for oxygen in the air to dissolve in the water. Fish can survive in very cold water in the same way land animals like bears can live out the winter. By becoming dormant, meaning slowing down bodily processes, eating very little, and consuming less oxygen. Why is the North Star important? The North Star, also known as Polaris, is important because it is the star toward which the northern axis of Earth points. It appears to shine directly over the North Pole. In ancient times, centuries before the use of navigational equipment, 
travelers knew that they could count on Polaris to tell them which direction was north. How do computers work? A computer, like all digital machines, changes writing, images, and sound into a special numerical language. It is a binary, or two-part, language that has just two number bears. 0 and 1. These numbers are called binary digits, or bits for short. In a digital machine, the numbers take the form of electric signals. With a 1 the electricity is switched on and with a 0 it is switched off. Information of all kinds, then, is turned into electrical on-off signals arranged in countless individual patterns. These patterns can be stored, sent along digital pathways. Or converted back into forms that we can use and understand with extraordinary speed and accuracy. Bits enter a personal computer from the keypad, mouse, microphone, and scanner. They are received and sent out by the modem, as well as stored in various memory devices. The computer screen, printer, and speakers convert the bits into forms of information that we can use. Why do beavers build dams? Beavers have amazing construction and engineering skills. They are among few animals that make dramatic changes to their environment to provide shelter for themselves and their young. Beavers are semi-aquatic which means they spend much of their time in water. Usually streams, rivers, and lakes. These hard-working creatures build dams using sticks, branches, mud, and anything else they can find to change the course of a stream. Sending some of the stream's water to flood another area in order to create a small pond. In that pond they can then build a lodge, a large domed structure where the beaver family can spend the winter. The lodge is built of the same materials used for the dam. Beavers use their long, powerful teeth to cut down branches and even whole trees. They then drag or float the wood over to the side of the lodge. Sometimes using canals, or narrow passages filled with water, that they built themselves. They pack the sticks together using mud, which freezes in the winter. Turning the beaver lodge into a strong fort that predators can't get into. While the lodge itself sticks out above the surface of the water, sometimes nearly six feet or almost two meters, the entrance to the lodge is underwater, giving the beavers further protection. In the months before winter approaches, beavers begin stockpiling food, including water plants, branches, and leaves. They anchor their food stash in the water just outside the lodge's entrance. So throughout the winter their food supply is nearby. Beavers have thick, shiny coats that have long been attractive to people in the fur trade. The North American beaver nearly became extinct in the 1930s due to extensive trapping for its fur. Another notable feature of these animals is their broad. 
flat tails that can be up to a foot long in some larger beavers. Beavers use their tails to steer when they are swimming and to help prop them up when they are standing. They also use them to communicate with other beavers. Slapping their tails on the water to produce a loud warning sound when a predator approaches. What is the Big Dipper? The Big Dipper is part of the constellation Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. It can be easily seen on a clear night in the northern hemisphere any time of the year. The seven stars in this group resemble a large water dipper with a long handle. The Big Dipper is useful in locating the nearby Little Dipper. Part of the constellation Ursa Minor, or the Little Bear. The Little Dipper, also made of seven stars, includes the important North Star at the end of its handle. What is a cocoon? A cocoon is an envelope-like structure made of silk that is spun by an immature insect or larva. It is a protective covering in which the larva passes through. It's an active pupa stage before it becomes an adult insect. These cocoons are often attached to branches or twigs. Caterpillars are the larva that eventually change or metamorphose, into butterflies and moths. Only a few types of butterfly caterpillars spin cocoons. A butterfly's cocoon is called a chrysalis, while the caterpillars of many moths do. The cocoon of the silkworm, caterpillar of the silk moth, is collected and processed and woven into the beautiful cloth we know as silk. Why are please and thank you magic words? Most human beings live with other people all their lives. You grow up in a family, learn along with classmates in your school, and participate with your friends and neighbors in activities in your community. You are a citizen of a country, which is one of many that make up the world. People have always lived together and over the years have developed something called manners. Or etiquette that help make all this togetherness of so many individuals a little easier. While these rules of conduct have changed from century to century and vary from place to place, they are all based on the idea that a person should treat others like he or she would like to be treated. People who have good manners are said to be polite. Polite people are appreciated because they have respect for others. Please and thank you are not magic words like abracadabra. Which a magician says as he pulls a rabbit out of a hat. But they are special words because they make dealing with other people go more smoothly. People depend on one another for all sorts of things. We have to ask for help or permission all the time. Saying please shows that your request also comes with respect for the person you are asking. People are usually more willing to fulfill the requests of those who treat them with respect. 
similarly, after someone gives you something or assists you. It is polite to say thank you to show your appreciation. Someone whose actions are appreciated will be more likely to help out or be generous again. So you can see how being polite can help people get things done. The words please and thank you make the world a more thoughtful and generous place. What is an island? An island is a body of land surrounded by water. While continents are also bodies of land surrounded by water, they are much larger in size. The smallest continent of the world is Australia. It has almost 3 million square miles, close to 8 million square kilometers, of area. That makes it almost four times the size of the world's biggest island Greenland which has an area of around 840,000 square miles, 2,175,000 square kilometers. Which sharks pose a danger to people? There are more than 350 shark species, and only a few of them have been known to attack people. Contrary to the habits of the bloodthirsty shark featured in the Jaws movies. Scientists don't believe that sharks purposefully hunt people. In most cases where sharks have attacked humans. They were probably protecting their territory or mistaking the person for a seal or another type of shark prey. Unprovoked shark attacks do happen, but they are pretty rare. The international shark attack file at the University of Florida recorded fewer than 80 such attacks throughout the world in 2000, 10 of those resulted in death. Around 30 different kinds of sharks have been known to attack people. With the white shark, the bull shark, and the tiger shark being the most common aggressors. How does television work? Television works through a series of complicated processes. It starts with a television camera, which takes pictures of scenes. Photo cells inside the camera change the pictures to electrical signals. At the same time, a microphone records sounds that are occurring during the scenes. A vibrating magnet in the microphone changes these sounds into electrical signals, too. Some television shows, like news reports, are recorded live. Which means that they are broadcast to homes as they occur. But most of the television programs that we watch are recorded which means that they are put on videotape and sent out later. The electrical signals of sound and pictures are stored as magnetic signals on videotape, which are converted back to electrical signals when played. Before a program is broadcast, its electrical picture and sound signals are run through a device called a television transmitter. With the help of strong magnets, 
the transformer turns the electrical signals into invisible bands of energy called radio waves. Similar to visible light waves, which can travel great distances through the air. They can travel directly to outdoor television antennae. Which catch the waves and send them to television sets that change them into pictures and sounds again. Cable companies send electrical picture and sound signals through cables directly to homes. When broadcasting to faraway places, communication satellites that orbit the world are used to bounce or return the waves back to Earth, extending their travel distance. Satellites are necessary because radio waves move in straight lines and cannot bend around the world. When an antenna or satellite dish receives radio waves, it changes them back into electrical signals. A speaker in a television set changes some of the signals back into sound. The pictures are reproduced by special guns at the back of a television set that shoot electron beams at the screen. Causing it to glow with tiny dots of different colors. Viewed together, the dots look like a regular picture. The individual pictures that make up a scene are broadcast and received one after. Another at a pace so quick that it looks like continuous action is occurring on the screen. The entire process happens very fast because television stations and broadcast towers are all around and because radio waves travel very quickly, at the speed of light. Radio programs broadcast talk and music across the airwaves using the same technology. What is a snowflake? When droplets of water in a cloud come into contact with tiny particles specks of dust. Tiny pollutants, minuscule pieces of vegetation that have been carried up by wind they freeze into ice crystals and begin to fall. Traveling through a cloud, these ice crystals may pass by air containing supercooled droplets. Which is water that is below the freezing point but remains a liquid. These droplets attach themselves to the sides of the ice crystals, where they freeze, forming snowflakes. When water freezes it forms flat, six-sided ice crystals. Though the way the crystals clump together accounts for a number of different snowflake shapes. As these crystals increase in size, they fall to earth. If the cloud from which they fall is low in the sky. The snowflakes are likely to stay frozen and will fall to the ground as snow. Although it's hard to imagine, each snowflake does seem to be unique. With a shape or size unlike any other. One American who enjoyed studying the weather, W.A. Bentley, spent nearly 50 years of his life making micro photographs of snowflakes to see if this was true. He never found two snowflakes that were alike. What are some of the different kinds of clouds? The different conditions of the atmosphere in which clouds form give them their special characteristics and shapes. The many different cloud types fall into three basic categories, 
low, middle, and high clouds. Cirrus clouds, which are made of ice crystals. Form high in the sky amidst very cold air. They often appear thin and wispy. Stratus clouds form low to the ground. Gray in color, they can often be found in low, coastal areas. White, fluffy cumulus clouds, also found fairly low, dot blue skies during fair weather. Some middle cloud types are alto cumulus and alto stratus. Nimbus clouds are storm. Clouds. They appear dark because the water droplets, or ice crystals, that form them have grown large large enough for gravity to eventually force them to fall to earth. When water droplets are small they reflect light. But when they grow large they absorb light and appear darker. Rain clouds can be low and flat looking or high and towering. The towering, anvil shaped rain clouds are called cumulonimbus. And these clouds are responsible for really bad weather like thunderstorms, hailstorms, and tornadoes. Who decides how a country is run? A country is run by its government. Countries around the world are run by many different kinds of governments. In some countries, a written law called a constitution states what kind of government will be used. It outlines the government's powers and duties, along with rights of the people governed by it. A constitution is agreed upon at the time a country is founded or is adopted at a later date by a country's leaders. Sometimes rules about how a country is governed are not written down, but are commonly known and followed becoming long-standing traditions. Many monarchies, for instance, in which a king or queen rules and another member of the royal family takes the throne after he or she dies, are examples of this. In such countries, the rules about who will inherit the throne are not written down as law but are decided amongst the royals. In many nations, government leaders get their authority to rule from the citizens of their countries. This authority is granted when people vote leaders into office during elections. Rulers chosen in this way are usually called presidents or prime ministers. And their governments are considered democracies because the power to govern is granted to the leader by the majority of their citizenry. If the citizens of a democracy feel that their leader is doing a poor job running the country, they can remove him or her from office in another election. Many people think that a democracy is the best form of government because citizens have some control over their lives and their country through their government representatives. There are other forms of government in which the authority to lead is given to an individual by just a few powerful citizens or is inherited for life. A government that is led by one person who has complete or absolute power over the citizens is called a dictatorship. Some dictators known as tyrants take charge of the country by force rather than by being appointed. Such rulers generally run governments that disregard the needs of their 
people because they aren't required by law to answer to their people's needs. They can only be removed from their positions of power by others like them who possess greater force. When such rulers and their governments are overthrown, the process is often violent and bloody. Why is the sky sometimes red at sunset? At sunset, the sun is low in the sky. And its light must travel through more of Earth's atmosphere to reach us. The extra air keeps shorter light waves like blue from making their way to Earth. But orange and red, with their longer wavelengths, can travel the distance and are scattered by Earth's atmosphere, becoming visible. They make the sun and the surrounding sky appear red. How do submarines sink and rise? The body of a submarine is uniquely constructed. Under its strong outer hull are huge ballast tanks that surround its working core. The tanks can be filled with and emptied of seawater and air. Which allows the submarine to sink or rise in the water. When a submarine travels on the surface, its ballast tanks are filled with air. Which makes it less dense than the seawater it displaces and it floats. But when a submarine needs to submerge or dive below the surface, its ballast tanks are flooded with seawater. This action makes the submarine sink. Now equal in density to the water that surrounds it, it can move about below the surface. Motor-driven propellers are used to move the vessel along, its streamlined shape creating as little water resistance as possible. And swiveling fins located on its sides, called hydroplanes, direct it up and down. When a submarine needs to return to the surface, compressed air stored in tanks is blown into the ballast tanks. This air forces out the seawater, and the vessel begins to rise, aided by the hydroplanes. Once again lighter than the seawater it displaces, the submarine is able to float on the surface. 